Good morning and welcome to the Port Townsend Seventh Day Adventist Church. We're so glad that you are worshiping with us this morning, and we pray that you will be blessed by sharing our time together this morning. Our scripture reading comes from Isaiah 65, verse 24, that says, Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. Powerful words that tell us that God is there listening to us and answering our prayers, oftentimes before we even ask. And later in the message, you'll get a story that will explain that. I've chosen the title, Treasures and Lessons from the Sea, because I wanted to share with you some things about one of my all-time favorite places to go, and that is the ocean. It's a love that I developed as a child living in Southern California, where the beaches were sunny and the water refreshing. It's just a wonderful place to be. A lot of people, if you ask them, where would you picture the perfect vacation? It's on an exotic island with palm trees and sipping juice out of a coconut while you're sitting there in the shade of a, a little cabana watching the waves lap on the shore. Yet on the other hand, it can also be a place of fear. You have creatures like sharks and all it takes is one shark fin to appear off a swimming beach and panic starts. And Hollywood has capitalized on that with movies called Jaws and, and The Meg and things like this that just get people all freaked up about even wanting to put their toes in the water anymore for fear of what might be out there. Don't let that keep you away from the beach. It's still a wonderful place to be. So much of the world's oceans are unexplored. Many are too deep to get to the bottom of. There's the Pacific Ocean, which we're the most familiar with here where we live. There's the Atlantic Ocean on the East Coast, the Arctic Ocean, the Indian Ocean, and what I used to call in my teaching the Antarctic Ocean, which is now called the Southern Ocean. These are places where early explorers traveled, seeking treasure and riches and perhaps a new passage to a distant land, or they simply wanted to be the first to get to a place where nobody else had been before. One of my favorite stories is the story of Ernest Shackleton, who sailed on the endurance to try to be the first to reach the South Pole. And the story of how his ship was trapped in the ice and destroyed. And he was able to safely guide his men to an island where they could stay while he went in a very small boat on a treacherous journey to a place where he could get help. They all survived. No one was lost. But that's the subject of a whole nother sermon. These explorers returned home with tales of strange creatures, monsters even, and fierce storms that they survived, but also with gold and silver and fabric and furs and spices and many treasures that they came across in their travels. So as we start today, let me share some interesting facts about the ocean that I discovered as I began my study this week in preparation for today's message. Something that I didn't realize is the deepest parts of our oceans are called the Hadal Zone, H-A-D-A-L. And that's named after Hades, which is where the underworld of Greek mythology took place. And it's below 20,000 feet deep. So that's pretty deep out there. If you take Mount Everest and put it down in the bottom of the Mariana Trench, the deepest part there known as Challenger Deep, 
it would totally be in, in that trench and underwater. That's how deep it is out there. Th uh, 35,755 feet to 36,197 feet deep is some of the average levels below sea level of the Mariana Trench. The underwater pressure at 20,000 feet is approximately 8 tons per square inch. Can you even fathom what that would feel like? So here's a picture for you. That's roughly the weight of 100 elephants standing one on top of the other on your head. Whoa, that's a lot of pressure. Ordinary instruments and things they try to send down to explore often implode and are just split into millions of pieces because of that intense pressure that they find down there. Jacques Cousteau took the first pictures of the Hadal Zone in 1956 that was the year I was born. So he was out there exploring and taking pictures of some of those places. He submerged the camera 24,500 feet down in the Roche Trench of the Atlantic Ocean. Recent expeditions in the Pacific suggest that fish are not found below 27,000 feet, but there are some shrimp and some other creatures that do live down there in those zones. And creatures that survive and thrive in those extreme environments are called extremophiles. Imagine that. These creatures can withstand very low temperatures, high pressures, and can survive with little or no oxygen. Pretty amazing place out there. The Bible talks to us about some things about the ocean. And I'd like to read a passage as you're listening to the waves. It comes from Psalm 107, beginning in verse 23. And you might want to just close your eyes and listen to the waves and picture what this would feel like. Psalm 107, verse 23. Others went out to sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds of the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths in their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wit's end. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves and the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love. Quite a dis description there of what that would be like from the Bible to be in a storm out at the sea. My only experience with that is when I was on a summer ministries program one year up in Juneau, Alaska. When we left to come back, we were mostly in the inside passage on an Alaska ferry. But a couple of times we came out from between islands and a big storm hit. And we'd been sound asleep, but the, the, the ferry hit a wave that took the front of the ferry up and crashed it down and it just jarred everything. That's a, a scary experience to be on a ship out there in a storm like that. When is the first time in the Bible that we hear about the oceans or the sea. Creation. Creation, do you remember what day it was? On the third day, 
In Genesis 1, verses 9 and 10, God called the dry ground land, and he gathered the waters that he called seas. They're on the third day of creation. And then throughout Scripture, we have other stories that are told about the ocean. What about the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea? They're standing before this vast sea. The Philistines are coming after them, or the Egyptians, or, you know, they're, they're trapped. And Moses says, wait and see the hand of God. The waters part, and they're walking through. So I was thinking about this through the mind of a child. I like low tide because that's a good time to go shell collecting. So you've got these kids going through. Their parents are tugging on them, but they see a shell, and they want to pick up that shell and put it in their pocket. Or they walk up to the wall of water, and they want to touch it, but the parents grab them and pull them back because they don't know, could something happen? Through the mind of a child, what an experience that must have been to walk through that sea on basically dry ground. That's an amazing story. And then there's the story of Jonah. Jonah was asked to deliver a message, but he changed his mind and decided he didn't want to do that, even though God asked him to. So he ran from God and got on board a ship. You know the story. Ends up going the other way, trying to get to Tarshish, and ends up being swallowed by a large sea creature of some kind. And he decides maybe he should have listened to God in the first place. And he, and he goes and, and gives the message he's supposed to. One of my favorite texts in the Old Testament comes from Micah 7, verse 19, which tells us that he casts our sins to the depths of the seas. And I love that thought. My mom used to be of the mentality that what if I die and I have one sin that I haven't remembered to confess? But God tells us he casts all of our sins to the depths of the seas. So if we just say, God, please forgive me, I think it's a package deal. And then he says, what sins? They're gone. And I shared with you how deep that is. So they're kind of hard to recover from down there if we just leave them alone. Luke 8 gives us a story about Jesus being asleep in the back of the boat. He's in his father's hands so he can sleep in the midst of a storm. The disciples are freaking out. They, they think they're going to die. But Jesus calms the storm, once again, on a sea. And then Revelation 13 speaks about beasts coming up out of the depths of the sea as we look at Bible prophecy into the future. But let's come back to today. I love the beach. I need time at the beach. I call it beach therapy. I love to backpack out to the Pacific coast, to pitch my tent fairly close to the water. You've got to be aware of high tide lines and the fact that there could be extreme tides. But then I love to explore the beach and I'm surrounded by things today that either I have found on the beach or a few things that people have given me that we're going to talk about. I hunt shells, I hunt sea glass, tsunami debris, agates, bones. But what I also like is the fact that there are many object lessons that we can draw from the things that you see or experience at the beach. So that's what we're going to do today. There are many treasures you can find, and we're going to look at some of those things. So I want to start with shells. Do any of you collect shells or did you as a child? Okay, a couple of you, yep. I grew up in Southern California, so we had warmer water, so we had some pretty nice shells down there off the coast of Southern California. But 
My family and I would often travel even further south and make trips down into Mexico where the more temperate water allowed more beautiful shells to grow and thrive in those waters. Many, many different kinds of shells. One of my favorites is called the cowrie. This is a tiger cowrie. We don't have these here. They're more from the South Pacific but, and the Philippines and places like that. But they're just a beautiful shell. And we used to have what were called chestnut cowries along the coast in Southern California that we could find. When it's alive, the animal has a mantle that it puts up over the shell, and that's what keeps it polished and beautiful. So that's a tiger cowrie. One of the shells we used to get in Mexico were the pink murex and the black murex. The outside of this one isn't as pretty as the inside, but the black murex is more white inside and has the black and white stripes, kind of like a zebra. It was thrilling as an eight or nine year old boy to find one of these as we were out in the, the tide pools looking for the different kinds of shells that we could find out there. Some shells are really fragile. This is one that comes again from the South Pacific. I'm not even sure the name of that one. But this is one that comes from Southern California. It's called the bubble shell. If I took it and just applied very little pressure, it would just crush because it's so fragile. Yet it's really a pretty, beautiful little shell that we used to find on the beaches there. Again, one of my favorites to find were the three-winged murexes. There was a place at Dana Point where we used to go and find these. They were not found on many of the beaches in Southern California. In fact, Dana Point was one of the only ones. They put a big harbor in there. They came in and dredged all the bottom and all the rocks and everything to put in a huge harbor. You don't find very many of these anymore because their habitat was destroyed. This one's special because it's an albino. Most of them were brown in color like this, but this one's pure white. So even shells can have albino characteristics. Another shell from Southern California is the top shell. It's kind of a cool shell, comes up to a point. This one has lots of seagrass on it, little seaweed, which made it so that it could be well camouflaged and so that it could hide out there in the tide pools. We'll talk some more about that in a little bit. Some shells can be dangerous. You have these cone shells that we used to find in Mexico, and we were taught you pick them up by the top because some varieties have a poison dart that they can shoot, and it can make you pretty sick if you get shot by that little dart that they can shoot out as a means of self-protection. So you only pick up a cone shell by this side and are very careful when you pick one up. Some are very fragile. I love this shell. Our daughter, it's a murex. Our daughter went on a mission trip to Fiji and she bought this shell for me she put it in an oatmeal container wrapped in layer after layer, layer of paper towel and she carried it on her body all the way from Fiji until she got off the plane and we were there at the airport to meet her when she got back and she said, Dad, I brought you this. This is a very special gift that I'll always cherish but a thing of beauty, but also a thing of danger because I have the memory, once again, as an eight or nine-year-old boy of doing the shelling down in Mexico. You would look for bumps in the sand because that meant there was a shell underneath there. And this lady thought she was digging out an olive shell. She took her hand and, and went down into the sand rather quickly. 
there are clam shells in Mexico that have these same spines. And she impaled several of her fingers on those spines. It was a beautiful shell, but she had some pain as she went ahead to dig that out and then had to deal with some pretty major bleeding fingers as a result of sticking those spines. So a little bit of self-protection for some of those creatures as well. Live shells are beautiful. Dead shells, when they're kicked around on the beach, they become beat up and ugly. So my lesson to think about there is, with Jesus in our hearts, we're beautiful. He helps us to be shiny and attractive. But if we walk away from him, we can become beat up, broken, and ugly. So I challenge you to stay with Jesus, and he will help you be the people that he has designed you to be. Lessons from a starfish. Any of you ever pick up a starfish as a kid and take it home? What happened? <laughs> we all think, oh, that's cool. It'll just dry out and be cool. But they smell. Unless you know how to preserve them, they smell and they rot. So sometimes... Up in that high tidal zone, I found this one out at the coast here. It was already dried and preserved for me. This one I bought. But you got to be careful about what you pick up out at the beach because it can turn to be pretty stinky if you're not careful. Our lesson there is sometimes if we try to do things on our own, we can make a stinking mess. So it's better to work with others, to really rely on God, to help us to figure out how to do things, seek counsel from others, and ask for God's guidance. One of the things that you have to learn to deal with, especially if you like to go out on boats, are the currents. And even if you're swimming on the beach, you have something called riptides, that can pull you out to sea. There's some pretty intense riptides on the Washington coast here. But we have those in Southern California as well. So when you took swimming lessons, they would teach you, if you feel yourself being pulled out to sea, first don't panic. But swim to the side, start angling, and go with the flow of the current. And then you can feel when you get out of the riptide. Because most riptides... You can see from aerial shots that they pull out and then they spread. The thing that usually happens is people get fearful and they panic and they try to swim against the current and they wear themselves out and they drown. So just go with the flow and then come around and then the waves will bring you back to the beach. A month ago, Heather and I went down to Grayland, just south of Westport for our 30th anniversary. We went down to where we could see the mouth of Willapa Bay. And we both just stopped and looked because it looked like somebody had a giant egg beater. The water out there at the mouth of the bay was just wild with waves hitting each other and splashing up and just the currents going every which way. And that's what happens during a tidal change when water from the bay is draining out and then the tide begins to turn and push back in where they meet just becomes chaos. A week ago, I was down at the mouth of the Columbia River where the same thing happens. And many of the pullouts as you're driving along Cape Disappointment have informational pages on these boards that tell you of all the ships that went down out there because the sailors didn't know the dangers of traveling this part of the coast. And many, many ships went down. In fact, one ship that was bringing supplies to build a, a lighthouse there at Cape Disappointment sank and all of the materials went to the bottom. 
So those currents can be pretty dangerous. So we need to be watchful of what is happening around us. We need to be careful not to be swept away by rough seas. So be vigilant. Keep your eye out. And probably the most important thing is don't try to navigate on your own. I have my ship's wheel up here. As a reminder, let Jesus take the wheel. And he'll navigate you through the rough seas in your life that you encounter and experience. Along with the currents, we have waves. And all of us have heard about the big ones, the tsunamis that come in. They're the most destructive of the waves that kill and destroy. Usually there are warnings, but the tsunami that hit over there in Asia at that resort area, there was no warning. And the water just emptied from the bay and everybody went, oh, this is cool, we can go get shells. Oh, there's fish in these tide pools. They all went out there and then they saw the wall of water coming and many people drown. Those tsunamis bring treasures. Some people consider it trash. I have just a few of those items here. These came ashore and I found them on the Washington coast in the couple years following the tsunami in Japan that happened, I believe it was in 2011. So this is a Japanese iced tea bottle. I have some sort of all-purpose cleaner here. The labels are all in Japanese, so I think they're cool. So I collect them and show my students. Here's a hand sanitizer container. Fran, we could refill this and, and, and use some tsunami debris for a hand sanitizer. As a teacher, I was interested in a glue stick that came across the seas. And then there are a lot of water bottles that have bottle caps that have Japanese writing on them. So I try to pick as many of those up and bring them home as, I went, as many as I can, but there's a lot of those out there as well. So tsunamis. Another type of wave that we have in Washington and Oregon are sneaker waves. They're a big rogue wave that comes in and catches people unaware. And it was just a few weeks ago that I read about one down on the Oregon coast that swept a father and his two kids out to sea. And I believe all three of them drowned because they come up on the shore, they just crash and knock you down, and then as they recede, they pull you back out to sea in the rough surf. And all three of them did not survive that. So the lesson, be watchful and vigilant. My mother named me well, because my name Gregory means watchful and vigilant. That's how I find all these treasures. I've always got my eyes open. But we've got to be watchful and vigilant. We've got to watch for danger because in our lives today, Satan's after us and he wants to take us out. I love the text that talks about putting on the full armor of God because if we put on the full armor of God, we will be able to be protected from the attacks that he brings on us and we'll be able to stand. Along with the currents, and the, along with the waves and the tides are the tides. So we have the tides that go out, come in, go out, come in. Very predictable. High, low, just like clockward. They can predict exactly when the tide will be at its lowest and then when the tide will be at its highest. The tides are a reminder of God's hand in nature. They allow us a chance to view creatures that are normally obscured from our view down there under the water. And what amazes me is God designed these creatures to be able to survive out of water. And the tide will eventually come back in and cover them up until the next tide. I remember going down to Baja, California 
down into Mexico, south of Southern California, where there were huge tidal changes. And the lowest tides would be at night. So we would take lanterns and we'd go out into this one bay called um, Choya Bay, and we'd hunt for shells at night because that's when they come out to feed. But we had to be very vigilant as to the tides and we had to know the time the tide would turn because we had to get back to the beach because the tides come in very quickly, like in the Bay of Fundy. The tides come in quickly, and you wouldn't want to get trapped out there at night. But we found beautiful shells out there. There was a time a few years ago when I was out at Third Beach that I did get trapped on the beach. I misread my tide chart the tide I thought was going out. And there's a, a special cove that I like to go to that you can only get to at low tide. So I started out there, but there was a place the water was blocking already, so I thought, well, okay, I'll stop and eat my lunch as it goes out. But as I was eating my lunch, I figured out it's not going out, it's coming in. By that time, there were places over here that the water had already covered the rocks. I couldn't stay where I was because I was trapped and that whole area would have been underwater. Yes, I got wet getting back to the beach, but that taught me a lesson again about being vigilant and being more aware and make sure I'm reading the tide charts correctly because I was wrong. So we have to be watchful. God has given us prophecies. He's given us scriptures. He's given us guidance in his word. So we know what's coming, and we can look ahead and prepare so we don't get surprised. And a lesson from the predictability of the tides, things will change. When the tide is out, it will come back in. When the tide is high, it will go back out. Seems like right now during COVID, the tide is in and we're kind of swamped and struggling. But the tide will change. We just have to do our part to help make sure that we're doing what we can to stop the spread of the disease. And we need to remember that God is in control. Another thing I love about the beach are sea stacks. We didn't have those growing up in Southern California. But here in Washington, we have sea stacks. And sea stacks form when waves and wind and water erode the softer soils away and leave clumps of rock and dirt out there in the water that are stronger and able to withstand those for a longer period of time. When I think of a sea stack, I'm reminded of my need to stay connected with Jesus because as you're connected to the land, they're stronger. As I'm connected to Jesus, I'm stronger. But I also need to be connected to my fellow Christians because it's in community that we find ourselves stronger and more able to stand. I can't get discouraged by the things that are happening around me, and I can't let discouragement drive me away from God. If I'm separated from people, I'm more vulnerable, and it's easier for me to fall to temptation. So stay connected. Let's turn our attention to some sea creatures. We're drawn to the large creatures of the sea. People pay a lot of money to go out on whale watches for just a glimpse of a whale. And every once in a while, it's only happened to me once, but I've seen a, a gray whale from the ferry going across to Seattle. At times, people see the orcas and other whales when they're on the ferry, but you pay for a whale watch, which they pretty much guarantee that you will see whales out there. So whether it's whales or orcas or sharks or dolphins or seals or otters, they're amazing and they're fun to watch. It's thrilling to see a whale breach or just to watch them swim. One morning when our kids were younger, we were backpacking out to Third Beach and the beach was pretty well empty and we were eating our breakfast and we heard this 
And we kind of looked at each other and said, what was that? And then we looked out and we saw the back of a gray whale come up just right out there in the water from the bay. We just sat there. Our children were blown away by the beauty of that creature as close. We saw it spout a few times, heard the noise as it swam through the bay and went around the corner and went out to sea there. They're amazing creatures. There are a couple different types of whales. There's baleen whales. This is some of the baleen, and that amazes me in itself that a creature can have this in its mouth and use it to filter out food that it eats. You also have tooth whales, and with the tooth whales, we can look at the food chain because especially like with orcas and some other whales that have teeth, they eat seals and salmon. You know, the orcas do. You've got seals that eat fish. And then you've got big fish that eat smaller fish. And you've got smaller fish that eat plankton. Once again, an amazing life cycle and, and food cycle that God designed for these creatures to survive. It makes a very efficient food chain. Humpback whales, they're a baleen whale. They can range in length from 39 to 52 feet, and they weigh 79,000 pounds. Gray whales, they can be 45 to 50 feet long and weigh up to 40 tons. I can't say I've ever seen a nervous whale or a nervous shark or a nervous otter. So what's my takeaway? I need to be like them and not get so stressed about things in my life. I need to enjoy life more. And if you think of what it says in Luke 12, we get the advice to don't worry. Look at some things from nature. Look at the birds. They don't worry about food. I take care of them. Look at the flowers. I take care of them. Aren't we so much more important that God will take care of us? So I love that promise. I just need to not be stressed. I need to enjoy life. And I need to look at otters and realize I need to be playful and just have fun sometimes as well. There are many kinds of fish that live in the ocean. A lot of fishermen like to go out there and try to catch them. There are big fish. There are small fish. One of the fish that I enjoy are the puffer fish. This one has its own self-defense. All it has to do is puff itself up. When it's not puffed up, it's actually very small and sleek looking. But then it puffs itself up and it's very pokey. Maybe I shouldn't admit this, but my son smuggled this one back from the Philippines when he was on a mission trip because he knew I would love it. He found it buried in the sand dead on the beach. And so he just wrapped it up in a bunch of dirty clothes and put it in a suitcase. And they didn't find it coming through customs. So I have a puffer fish. God has given a lot of creatures good self-defense mechanisms to be able to take care of themselves. One of the object lessons from the sea that I like the most are kelp. Because kelp has what we call a hold fast. This hold fast, this is one that's off the rock. It secures it as it starts growing to a rock. And then the kelp grows up to the surface and these upper leaves um, you see oftentimes just waving around in the tides and the currents on the beach. If the hold fast is secure, it keeps that plant in place. During winter storms, some of them can be broken free and they end up washed upon the beach. But the whole fast usually does its job pretty well. I don't even have to explain the object lesson with that one because if we hold fast to Jesus, he's going to see us through the storms in life that we experience. The waves will crash around us, the winds can blow, the 
tides will change. But if we hold fast to Jesus, we'll be secure. Some other treasures I like to find on the beach are things you find on shore. Driftwood, sea glass, agates, and other pretty rocks. With the wave action in the sand, it sands down the driftwood. And when it's wet, they look totally different. I pick up ones that look really pretty. I bring them home and they dry out. They're not as pretty. But some of them, the shapes are really cool. Some of them, the patterns just really come out. And I'm going to try varnishing these because I think that'll help to bring some of the color back out as well. But so many different kinds of driftwood. And I, I love this one. I found this one last week, which looks to me like a whale. And this way, the whale's going down. But you turn it this way, and it still looks like a whale <laughs> coming to the surface. And it just so happens there's a little barnacle there that looks like a tooth. So driftwood is something that's really fun to find on the beach. Sea glass is another one of the things that I like to find. I've got quite a bit of sea glass here. North Beach is one of my favorite places to collect sea glass. Um, there's a little bottle. I'll get one certain color. This is the beautiful blue sea glass and put it in a little bottle and display it. Sometimes Heather asks me, don't you have enough? And I say, no. Because <laughs> I enjoy part of it. I guess I'm a guy and it's the hunt. I like to go out and hunt. So I, I go hunt sea glass and come home with a whole pocket full sometimes. Some people think, what's the big deal with it? But for me, I see beauty in it. And I'm thankful that God sees the beauty in me and values me for who I am. Beach agates are another thing that I really enjoy finding. Beach agates, when you find them, they're, they're kind of polished. You, they just look different and they feel different from other rocks. And they're special because there's not a lot of them. Here's an example of a beach egg that I found out at North Beach. Doesn't look that amazing. And you can come up and look at this afterwards. Here's a polished beach egg. And it just brings out colors and stripes and lines. And just amazing beauty. Something else you find on the beach are nets. I have a net up here. Also have my otter pelt that I found actually hit on the road down by Silverdale. It had come up through Dye's Inlet there, came up a creek and was trying to cross the highway and got hit. And I skinned him out. Something else I wanted to show you along with that is this is an otter skull. And a fascinating thing with the otter skull, they eat a lot of mussels. And you notice his teeth are the same color as the inside of the mussel. So I assume it's the, the chemicals inside the muscle that turn the shell blue actually turn the teeth of the otter that same color from part of his diet. This is a whale vertebrae. You can come up and see that after as well. But nets. The fishermen put the nets out. They use floats to keep the net floating upright and then weights in the bottom. So there's a lot of different types of floats that you can find now. This one has a lot of Japanese writing on it. These smaller floats like this. These are the ones that are used today. But floats that were used in Japan. Oh, ah, how did I do that? Starting in about 1910, they switched to glass floats. They stopped using wooden and cork floats, and they switched to the glass floats. So this is one of those that somebody gave me as a kid that somebody had found. And I was always fascinated by the glass floats because they were something that were very special. And after the tsunami, in 2011, a lot of these glass floats started washing ashore. 
not a ton, but more than usual. So I want that to stage just a story to conclude my sermon here. Back in May of 2014, enrollment at Cedarbrook had declined, and the school board voted to go to one teacher because we couldn't afford to keep two teachers anymore. I started my career in a one-teacher school in Wairica, Northern California for the first seven years. Then we were able to hire a second teacher and my life got a whole lot easier. Here I was approaching the end of my teaching career, 34 years later, and I was going back to a one-teacher school. I needed some time to process this, so I did what I often do, is I put my backpack on and went out to Cape Alava to spend some time on the beach. I was having a conversation with God as I walked south on the beach after I set my camp up and fixed some dinner and then went for a walk before sundown. It's May, it's getting dark early. I went down the beach a ways and then turned to come back. And I'm having conversations with God saying, God, I don't know that I can do this. I'm not as young as I used to be. The long hours, the work it takes to keep a one-teacher school going. God, I'm going to ask something of you. I got very specific. I said, God, you gave people in Bible times signs that you would be with them. So I'm going to ask for a sign. I need the assurance that you are calling me to do this task of teaching in a one-teacher school. And I need the assurance that you will equip me to do the task at hand. So I said, God, I'd like to find a glass float. So at sundown, Friday night, it's getting dark. No sooner had I prayed that prayer, I looked to the west. And what did I see out there in the water? I was hoping for one on the beach. But God has a sense of humor, and I had to work for this one. No way to get to it but to go out there. There was nobody else around, so I took my clothes off. I didn't know if I was going to have to swim or what, but... Fortunately, it only got about this deep because it was a fairly gradual slope down. But I went out there and I grabbed that thing because it was moving on the current. And I came back to the beach and I knelt down praising God for that answer to prayer. So I was hoping for something like this. And this is what he gave me. That's a pretty amazing answer to prayer. I, I just knelt on the beach and just held this because it was just so spectacular. God doesn't always answer prayers this way, but he knew that I needed this answer to that prayer. I think I went right back to camp and called Heather on my cell phone and, and let her know because I do have cell service out there. And then sent her some pictures of it. But you know what? That wasn't good enough because the next morning I got up and it, it was a little cold in the shade. So I walked down on the beach to eat my instant oatmeal. A group of students and their teachers had walked by. A whole bunch of people going up the beach. I went down. I'm holding my bowl of oatmeal, and I'm eating it, just facing the sun. And I look beyond my bowl, and literally between my feet, between my feet was this float. This is what I was asking for the night before. God blessed me with that. And he blessed me with this one. I'll tell you, 
God doesn't always answer prayers in this amazing way, but he knows when we need a miraculous answer to prayer. We serve an awesome God. The next year I had to ask if there was more than a one-year guarantee on the float, and he said yes. So here we are getting ready to start the 2020-2021 school year. And God has promised to be with me. We serve an awesome God. My challenge for you today is to keep your trust in God strong. In this crazy world that we live in today, take the time to commune with God in nature and watch for the lessons that he has for you to encourage you on your daily journey each day. Bow your heads with me for a prayer. Father, thank you for the way that you work in our lives. Thank you for the wonders of your creation and the wonders of the ocean and the life we find there. Fill our hearts and our spirits with your love today and help us to keep our eyes on you as our prayer in your name. Amen.